I talk, because I, I have issues with that. So uh, I have to apologize in advance. Um, when I started putting this together, um, the only reason why we put at the topic to sleep, does everybody want to sleep here? Yeah, it's kind of like one of those universal things, you know what I mean? Like if we were talking about diabetes, we're like, well, that's not me. If we're talking about cancer, we're like, that's not me. Like literally everybody sleeps. Um, and, and the problem is, is that it's one of the most common questions that I get in my office is people complaining about sleep. Um, they just, it's just, it's just, especially in this valley and especially the way that we live our lives here. And so that's where this came up. And so I started working and I started putting it together and I'm like, oh, they need to know this and they need to know that and they need to know this. So because of that, it ended up being 40 slides. So we're going to have to power through this. It was going to be a two hour presentation. I promise to keep it less than that. Um, if you have questions afterwards, but I'm going to really hit on the high points that I want you guys to be able to take home with you. I don't want to cause you stress to keep you from sleeping tonight, but I want to empower you to realize that you, know, you guys can do it. So really what I want you to understand is when we look at, does anybody know what this is? This is sleep deprivation torture, okay? It's actually an accepted form of torture. Um, and what happens is, is that the reason why it's, why it's actually people have challenges with it is because it affects all biologic systems in the human body. A person can go for about 24 hours. After about 72 hours, they haven't done any experiments on that like because they think, because it'll be so detrimental to a human being. And so what we start to see is, if you guys have noticed this, the first part that we have is within the first, the first part we start getting feelings of fatigue, we start getting irritable. Like, you know, we know that when we had a bad night's sleep, right? And then the second thing that starts happening is we start losing the ability to speak clearly and we lose our ability to regulate our temperature. That means our body's starting to shut down because being able to regulate temperature is one of those profound things that we need to be able to do. And then we start to get an increase in our appetite there. Have you ever noticed that when you stay up late, what do you end up doing? You eat, you eat right? Well, you start eating and then like there's that point in the middle of the night, like you're like, oh, I'm really tired and you're falling asleep on the couch. And you're like, whoa, I need to change the show because that show is over. We go to the next one. Next thing you know, we're spending just as much time watching TV as we are walking back and forth to the kitchen there. And then the next part is we start getting disoriented and we start getting misperceptions. And that's why it makes no sense to do sleep torture with people because they, after about 24 to 48 hours, they lose their ability to actually recollect exactly what happened. So if you're not sleeping for 48 hours, you literally lose your ability to actually perceive the world in an appropriate way. And then the last part is it's fatal. When you don't get enough sleep, it's actually a fatal thing. Because what happens is that when we sleep, that's the time when our body actually repairs and it regenerates itself. That's when our neuro, the hormones in our brain regenerate themselves. That's when the tissue in our body actually regenerates itself. That's why the nervous system is so active at night because your nervous system controls how your body heals, how it repairs, and how it regenerates. And so when you're not sleeping, the nervous system isn't able to do the job that it was designed to do. So that's why on the way over here, I passed three of these. I also passed two pharmacies on the way over here, and, I, and my office is 1.2 miles away from here. It's not very far, so we literally, would you guys agree with me that we kind of live, live in a sleep deprived uh, society here? Like that's uh, one of the biggest things that, that people have. So what happens is, is that lack of sleep is a stress. It's an absolute stress to the human body. And what we start to see is it's gonna affect everything from accidental death to waking. It weakens our immune system. We, we're more prone to accidents and depression. But when we start looking at how this impacts the America that we live in, what we start to see is that it, right now, 75% to 95% of every single doctor's visit in the United States is for a stress-related disorder. Okay, there's some genetic things, there's some traumatic things that happen that are beyond our control. But we gotta own this stress that we live in. And what happens is if our body can't repair and regenerate from it, we will have stress-related disorders. 50% of our population gets cancer. We have one-fourth of the people sitting in this room. Whether you like it or not, it's gonna have diabetes at some time in your life at the rates that we're, that, that we're increasing, that we're going there. 75% of us have digestive orders, and 28%, almost one-third of the people in the United States right now have high cholesterol issues. Like you know those people and you probably, if you look at your medical records, that's probably you to a degree. And so what we have to realize is that the, the lives that we live to sleep is gonna have a dramatic impact. And that's what my goal is to show you tonight is the impact that sleep will have and the profound impact that it's gonna have on your life and it's gonna have on your relationships and how to actually get a really good night's sleep so that you can actually be, not be a statistic that's up on the board there. The problem is this. 
our current state of health, right now, it's just getting worse. Can we be in agreement on that? Like, if you look at the people that, like, the people that you know, are they, are they like, getting healthier and, and more, like, connected and having more energy? I mean, except for the people in our office. I mean, <laughs> except for those people, like, outside of our office. Like, I mean, you start looking around you, are people taking less or more medications? More. Yeah, they're taking more. We take 80% of the medications in the entire planet. That's insanity. And we are only 5% of the world's population. That makes absolutely no sense. And the problem is, is that we are living longer, but we're also having more chronic diseases. And that's the big challenge is, is that just because you're living doesn't mean you're alive. And that's what my goal is for you guys, is to fully experience the life that you've been given and the way that you've been designed to be given it. So what we have to do is if we have to, we have to come to terms of what disease is. We have to, this chronic disease that we're talking about, we actually have to come to terms with it. So one of the biggest things, and this is a, this is a, a common understanding in healthcare, is that disease is our body's ability, inability to adapt to stress, okay? When your blood pressure goes up and your body can't adapt to it, that's when we have a heart attack. Does that make sense? Like your body can't adapt to that stress there. If you, if, you, if you go outside and your body can't adapt to the stress of the cold when you walk outside afterwards, your body's gonna lose so much, temp, so much temp heat that it's not gonna be able to survive there. Disease is our body's inability to adapt to the stresses of our daily life. And so there's only one cure, and there's a typo there, and I don't wanna hear about it. Um, there's only one cure for disease. And that is that you have to understand that the body, human body is a self-healing, self-regulating like, organism. That's what it is. You cut yourself, you heal. Even the best surgeon in the entire planet, if they cut, if they cut somebody, they cannot make that dead body heal. Only an alive body can heal. The power that made the body heals the body and does it every single time. As long as there's no interference. As long as we're not interfering with that power of your body to be able to heal itself, then what's going to happen is, is that we're going to have the ability to heal. So understanding that there's one cause, the body's inability to adapt to the world that we live in and adapt to stress, there's only one cure, is the removal of any interference to our body being able to, to adapt. That's it. That's how you stay healthy for the rest of your life, and that's what we're going to be talking about right now. So what does this have to do with the nervous system? And this is an important thing because if we miss this one thing, we're going to miss everything. When we look at our nervous system, we live our lives through our nervous system. Our, our whole experience with the world is through our nervous system. Every stress that you've ever had in your life, that you've experienced through your nervous system there. But what we also have to understand is it's filtered and processed through the brain. And then when the stress becomes chronic, it overwhelms that your, your body's ability to adapt. And the last part is it leads to a covert habituated unhealthy patterns of how your body adapts to stress. So our body's ability to adapt is through our nervous system. The ability to be healthy is our body's ability to adapt. Prolonged stress on our nervous system interferes with our body's ability to adapt to our environment and the stresses that we have there. And there's three different types of stresses and you guys all know it. It's like I don't have to talk. I'm, I literally could, does anybody not have stress here? Okay, good. Because then you would be dead, and then we'd save money on your meal. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> but the point is, is that this, we have three types of stresses. They call them emotional, physical, or chemical stresses. There's only three types of stresses that are out there. And what we have to look at is, is that our bodies are, physical stress is not just a car accident. Physical stress is just not moving. Physical stress is sitting there for eight hours a day at a computer, day in and day out, for 30, 40 years, doing the same thing there. Uh, we look at the, the chemical stresses. It's, it's not just that if you don't smoke or you smoke. There's chemical sweeteners in the foods, that the air that we breathe, the toxins that we're exposed to on a regular basis. Those are all chemical stresses there. Those things have a dramatic impact on our nervous system. Every single one of these stresses impacts us day in and day out, and they build and they build and they build. Money stresses, financial stresses, emotional stresses with kids. Look, I got kids, like I've been worried about them since the day they were born. I don't think, I think my, uh, my wife and I finally came to the conclusion that we'll be worried about them until we die. You know what I mean? I go to bed, my wife still goes to bed checking find my friends, hopefully my daughter's not watching, to make sure my daughter is safe back in her dorm in college right now. It just, it allows her to sleep, but we, we're wired this way. The problem is, is that these three dimensions, they, 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 over time, it's like a glass that fills up. You know, if you had an emotional stress when you were two years old, it's not a big deal. 
But it's these unresolved emotional stresses, these unresolved physical stresses and chemical stresses over a lifetime. They literally add up and they add up and that's when our nervous system becomes overwhelmed. And so when we start looking at Amy, so Amy comes in, normally you're gonna have a nice curve in your neck that looks like this. You should have a nice smooth curve here. The atlas comes down. This right here is where your brain stem is. That's where the respiratory centers are and the cardiac centers are for your, for, for your breathing. Right down here is where the nerves go that go to your diaphragm that allow you to breathe there. So you're, for, when we start, this is, a, this is Amy's picture. So knowing nothing about her, is she healthy or sick? Does that make sense? Like, is there any way her nervous system is going to be able to function at 100%? If this is normal, and this is where she comes in. Here she is. Amy's, what, she's 38 years old at that time. And the reason why I put this up here, she's on anti-anxiety medications. She's taking, she has, she's on cholesterol medications, she has high blood sugar, she has diabetes, and she has digestive issues there. She has an irritable bowel syndrome there. So she's like a typical person there, and she comes into the office and she has all these health issues, and my first question is, is I ask her, like, well, how do you sleep? And she's like, I don't. I don't sleep. And I said, okay, now that can make, now that makes sense. The problem is that's what short-term sleep deprivation does. It, what happens is, is that when you're under, when you're not sleeping, it's a stress to your body. The first thing, when you don't get enough sleep, your stress hormones go up. So the next day, guess what happens? You don't wake up feeling re refreshed. You wake up feeling stressed, and when you're under stress, we human beings have what we call a negativity bias. And this negativity bias means that, have you ever woken up after a bad night's sleep and everything's bad? You know, there might, there's, a, there's a book my son used to, my wife used to read to my son, it's called, I think it was Oliver's No Good, Very Bad Day. You know what I mean? And it's like, oh, this is bad, and then this happened, and then, you know, we start looking for all the bad things, and then guess what that does to our stress hormone levels? Mm -hmm. Right, and it, 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 it increases our stress hormone levels, and guess what happens with stress hormone? It in interferes with our body being able to go into what we call REM sleep. REM sleep is where all that healing and repair and regeneration happens. We look at cholesterol. When, we aren't un when we're under stress, our body's just going to raise our cholesterol levels. That's just the way it is. We are perfectly designed. The cholesterol levels go up because it thinks that we're under a threat. And then what ends up happening is that it raises cholesterol levels to actually repair and regenerate. It raises our cholesterol levels to increase our, our, our neurotransmitters in our brain. It increases our cholesterol levels to be able to, 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 re to, to actually to protect our body. Cholesterol is necessary for our, for our brain to actually function. So, and then we, so then she has a high, high blood sugar. Well, when you're under stress, your body's gonna raise high blood sugar. When you're, and she had, she had, she was taking antacids there. And as you're gonna find out later on, what ends up happening is that the medications that you take for anxiety, they interfere with your body being able to go into REM sleep. So guess what happens the next day? She didn't get REM sleep just from her medications that she was taking. And so guess what's gonna happen the next day? She's gonna wake up more stressed. And then she's gonna take her anxiety medication, and then she's not gonna get REM sleep that night. And she's gonna get this slow deterioration in her brain. Guess what happens with anti-cholesterol medications? They interfere with your body being able to go into REM sleep. So if you're having problems going to sleep and you're taking cholesterol medications, now they're interfering with you being able to go to sleep, and now your cholesterol levels are gonna go up, and now you're gonna take your cholesterol medications to get your cholesterol down, and it's this vicious downward spiral there. Blood sugar, diabetes medication, actually, like the insulin, is actually a stress hormone. It prevents you from going into REM sleep there. So when somebody's taking their diabetes medication before they go to bed, they're not gonna be able to go into REM sleep. We look at the antacids. Antacids prevent you from going into REM sleep. Do you see the insanity of this crazy world that we start living in there? And we're only talking about one thing. We're only talking about sleep tonight. And so then what starts to happen is we start to break down, we get a weakened immune system, we start having higher disease rates. Amy is just one person. How many people out there do we know that? That are just like that? All right. Ah! Okay, so what I want you guys to figure out, what do we notice about our bodies right now? How's, how's, your, how's your heart rate doing? All right, and your blood pressure, do you think it's up or lower? There's a tiger right there, by the way, just in case. Does it, do you think that you're actually, like, your body was in a state of stress for just a second? But you knew it was safe. Does that make sense? You knew that I'm safe, so it was just that instantaneous startle. But if you didn't know you were in a safe place, you were already in a state, that's what stress feels like to us, but it's over a prolonged period of time. And many times we do this day in and day out, day in and day out. So then what's happening is stress, everything that she was experiencing, Amy was experiencing, is a normal physiologic response. Like if, if she has, 
if she's starting to feel, if you guys felt high, like a high heart rate, that's a normal physiologic response. Do you think your blood pressure was up? But what if you're at your doctor's office and he took your blood pressure medication, he took your blood pressure, and he'd say what? You're, you have high blood pressure, so what do we need to do? We need to get medication to get that blood pressure down. Does that make sense? Um, what if we went in there and your blood sugar was up after this? And, and you'd be like, oh, you have diabetes, so we need to give you something to lower. So the problem is, is with healthcare, is we look at normal physiologic responses to the environment that we live in. And we say that there's something wrong with that physiologic response. Our job is to, to normalize you, to bring you back to normal. Well, the problem with that is this, is that we take a normal physiologic response, we take a patented <coughs> chemical, we introduce this patented chemical into our body, that patented chemical now actually is, it becomes a stress and it alters it. There's no way, and that's why when we start looking at some of the, right now in May of this year, the British Medical Journal actually did a study, which is the fifth study of its type. They come out every single year, and we've been, creep, been creeping up medical errors as the third leading cause of death in the United States. That's not my opinion, okay? We're talking facts right now. Oh, by the way, side effects from properly prescribed medications that are there to actually to help to normalize a proper physiological response in your body is the number four leading cause of death in the United States. So if you avoid those two things, I think you're going to be in a pretty good place. And that means that we have to come out of our, our crazy corner over here. Our crazy corner over here that says, it's probably a really good idea that we introduce the chemicals into the body because that makes us healthier, right? Over here, our common sense part says, wow, my body's smart and intelligent and knows exactly what to do. And if my blood pressure is high, there's probably a reason for it. And I don't need to take a chemical to normalize it. I got to get to the cause. Over here, it says, well, you're powerless. You're, you, you're, just a, you're just a victim of our circumstances. And so somewhere in between, right here and here, we're going to have to make a decision whether we're going to take responsibility for our health and come over here in our common sense corner, or we're going to go back over here and we're going to be a victim and say, it's not my fault. It's just the way I was born. And it's, and it's easier to take a pill because a pill is a prescription not to, in which it gives you permission not to change your lifestyle. Okay? And just remember that. So when we look at sleeping drugs in the United States right now, we think, oh my gosh, we have this epidemic of sleeplessness. In just the, the past decade, we went from 29 million prescriptions to 60 million prescriptions in the United States for sleep medications. Can you imagine, like, to, to double, the, the, do you think that that many people were sleeping less? Well, what I will tell you is this, is that we've had the same amount of increase in all types of medications in the United States in the last decade. So of course it's gonna affect sleep there. And in fact, the, uh, the biggest challenge is when we start looking at these sleep medications, look at this. Studies show that you actually get to sleep about 13 minutes sooner. How cool is that? That's really, that's fantastic. Because it's a $3 billion industry. Sleep medications collected $3 billion alone last year. But they also find that you get about 11 more minutes of REM sleep per night when you're taking, on average. That means some people get less, some people get more. Can you imagine if you're taking a sleep medication? Oh, and by the way, the sleep medications, they don't allow you to get into REM sleep. So they actually cause you to be catatonic. They actually, it's like going into surgery. Like you're not sleeping when you're in surgery, when they give you, they anest basically they're anesthetizing you. And so, yes, you, and one of the side effects is that you don't remember things in the morning. So you don't even remember if you slept at night, that night at all. So when we look at that though, but what happens when we start to interfere or change the function of the body? I'm not gonna go into all of these things, but I couldn't even fit, the, uh, there was more that I could have put on there. But you start looking at this, constipation, diarrhea, dizziness, dry mouth, gas, wow. So if your husband's on sleep medication, you might wanna make sure that he gets off. Uh, heart headaches, heartburn, stomach pain, tenderness. Uh, oh my gosh, newly developed sleep disorders such as sleepwalking, sleep eating, or sleep driving. And guess what happens? When you stop taking the pills, you start getting a rebound atrophy. You cannot induce a patented chemical to the human body without a side effect. Unfortunately, we are not smart enough to know the unintended consequences of the actions that we take. There's always an unintended consequence. The problem is this. With all those side effects, guess what one of the main side effects of taking sleeping pills is? Death. <laughs> You're 4.6, that's not 4.6%, that's 460 times greater likelihood of dying when you take sleeping pills. 
460. You might as well. You better have a ch better chance of smoking a cigarette than actually <laughs> taking sleeping pills at night. Because not only do you you have a great 460 percent chance of dying greater with all these side effects associated with only 13 minutes of going to sleep sooner and 11 minutes of extra REM sleep where your body's regenerating. Do you guys see this crazy world that we live in over here? And we call this what? Normal, right? Well, of course. And in fact, when they study doctors, um, and they study, they, 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 doctors looked at it as a gift that they're giving to their, to their patients. That, that over 30% of doctors, when they prescribe sleeping pills, they give it as a gift to their patient because they think they're blessing them with a good night's sleep. There's a great web, website if you know somebody on sleeping pills, the dark side of sleeping pills there. By the way, suicide is one of the, uh, they, they, find, they call it suicide ideation. Um, there's, you can't interfere with how the brain works. Because guess what happens? You remember when we talked about sleep torture? The, those final phases, you just get irrational. And so what happens is, is people get irrational over time. So think about this. That's why we have what we call ambient zombies now. And when I had a patient that came in, and literally she was taking a sleep medication. She came in, drove to the office, came in, got adjusted, went to work, and came back in in the afternoon because she missed her appointment that morning. And I'm like, I looked at her and I'm like, uh, you were here, I was here, like I adjusted, it's right here. And she goes, no I wasn't. I'm like, no seriously, <laughs> you were in the office, like everybody saw you. But she had taken, like, it, it, what they start to find is, is that with these ambient zombies, they, they go into the refrigerator, they sleep, eat, they'll go in the refrigerator and like eat raw bacon sandwiches, and they'll, they'll have like, they'll, they'll literally just eat salt, like random things, they'll sleep, walk, and they'll go places, do things, and if so, if, what if your bus driver for your kids is taking an Ambien before they go to bed at night? Do you want them to drive there? Do you want the guy on the street to be driving? Do you want your, the, per, the, the mother of your friends that are driving your kids to be like taking these medications? Well, the thing is, is that there's 60 million prescriptions out there every single year. So the crazy people that you see on the street and on the, on, on the freeways and the people that are losing coordination and their ability to focus, you have to understand that they're probably in a sleep deprived state there. Now, what is normal sleep? How, what do you guys think normal sleep is? Eight hours. Eight hours, right? So here's what I'm going to show you is that they find that insomniacs are typically in bed about 14 hours a day. They're just trying to get the sleep. Does that make sense? They go to bed, they fight it, and they lay in bed, and they, they take naps during the day. What they find is there is a sweet spot, and it's right here. This sweet spot is between five and seven hours of sleep. The average human being, typically what they find is when they look at this, that, that, that their mortality rate, this is their, 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 it goes down when you get between five and seven hours of sleep. When you're getting 10 hours or more sleep, your mortality rate goes up hugely. That means you're spending half the time, almost a, a half of the day in bed. And think about this, one of the things we talked about is your body's designed to move. So when you're not moving, your body is not getting the oxygen that it needs for the cells. And so this is gonna be your sweet spot between five and seven hours. And this is gonna be crucial when we're talking about sleep training later on today, or tonight, or tomorrow if I keep going longer. Um, <laughs> so, but when we look at, the, when we start looking at, okay, well, I, you know, I, sleep is where I rest and I need my eight hours of sleep. What they found is that anybody sleeping eight hours was significantly at greater risk of having a stroke. So if, if, if you can't get yourself out of bed in the morning because it's going to be a tough day, just get yourself out of bed so you don't have a stroke. How's that? Yeah. I mean, I'm just, I'm just being real with you guys. And these are the facts. Like, this isn't just perception. This isn't just, you know, maybe an idea. These are the, I mean, the cold hard facts. I mean, when was the last time your doctor talked to you about this? How much sleep you should get? But what we do know is that if you don't, if you don't get sleep, you're going to be sick. And if you get too much sleep, your risk of mortality quadruples. So the healthiest people sleep between six and a half to seven hours. The average adult, the male, that, that, that they don't need more, I mean, the average adult doesn't need more than eight. It's okay if you're older to wake up a lot. So like when you look at a baby, they sleep because their brain's trying to build, their bodies are, you're, they, you have cells replicating. You have to take somebody that's this big and grow them to this big. It takes a lot of REM sleep for them to be able to do that. Well, as we get older, it's okay because people with insomnia that get less sleep, they actually live longer. Now, it's not like in sleeping in your chair doesn't count with the TV on, okay? That's not REM sleep. Like, even though it might be comfortable, do not fall asleep in your chair. We're gonna talk about sleep rituals with them being critical there. But it's the longer you spend in bed, 
uh, the more harmful it is to your body there. So get up and get moving there. Your body's designed to move. So here's what I need you to understand. This is another key concept. We talked about how your nervous system controls everything, how it, it, it changes how you perceive stress there. But there's two things that happen in your body. And this is, uh, this is like a math equation for all of our engineers that are in the room. So basically, there's a process called anabolism. Anabolism is what we call your constructive metabolism. It's the part that rebuilds your body there, okay? And, and, and catabolism is your metabolic breakdown. So your body's either repairing or it's breaking down. Your nervous system is in charge of how your body repair, of the repair. If there's an interference, if there's a stress to your nervous system, it's going to prevent your body from repairing. So if you're not repairing, you're breaking down there. So here's your, here's your math equation. Repair greater than breakdown, you have health. Breakdown greater than repair, you have disease there. So what does this all mean? Well, what, for, uh, the process that we need to start is we need to start our sleep training. And what sleep training looks like is this, is that you need to be asleep between 11 and 1 a.m. for optimal function, okay? So if you're studying for an exam, you need to be asleep for between 1 a.m. You got that project that's due and you have a big presentation tomorrow, you have to be asleep before 11 a.m. Because what starts to happen is, at that time, the gallbladder actually starts to become active. Your liver starts to detoxify itself. Your liver starts to, to start the repair process. And then we move into the liver, and then we move into the lungs, and then the large intestines, so they can start to evacuate. And, and so if we get off cycle there, that's why when they look at shift workers there, they have the highest rate of chronic disease because whether you have a light or not, like your body doesn't change based on like what you want. Does that make sense? Like, if you're trying to watch, like, get caught up on the Walking Dead series, and you're starting at season one, you decide they're gonna watch it, binge watch it for the next eight, eight days straight, you're gonna pay for that, unfortunately. And that's why, because you, you know, it interferes with what we call your circadian rhythms. And I actually put a chart in your handouts there. But what happens if you don't repair? These are all the symptoms if your body doesn't repair. Okay, how many of us have done this? We're like laying in bed just before we go to bed, and we're like looking at our phone, checking our last Facebook status update. We're checking our email, the most important ones just before we go to bed that can't wait till the morning. We're actually watching Netflix. The problem is, is when we do this, there's a, there's a frequency in screens. When we have a, most screens are going at about 60 hertz. What that does is that it interferes with our brains being able to actually go into a relaxation mode. So when you say, I'm just gonna go to bed, I'm just gonna watch a little boob tube before I go to bed, it wires up your brain and prevents your brain from actually going into that REM state sleep, which is crazy. Well, and the same thing applies to your iPad. So one of the first things that I, I suggest to people as part of your routine, at least 15 minutes, but ideally like you know 30 minutes, right? Um, Turn off all the screens in your, in your room there. Start reading something, something on paper that your body can, that in, preferably like the begots or something like that. He begot them and they begot them. It'll just you know, put you to sleep in a second. But the point is, is that read something that is not stimulating. Don't, you, know, you don't have to read like a Zane Gray novel or a Tom Clancy where you can't put it down. But you know, read something that's just nice and relaxing, something that can put you in a place of gratitude there. Because if we don't, what it does is it, it, we only get about two good hours of REM sleep that night. That's all we need, it's about two good hours. So the problem is this, let's say we're eating, and we eat just before we go to bed. Well, when we eat just before we go to bed, it raises our, our, um, our, our blood sugar levels, and it raises our, our, our um, insulin levels. When our <coughs> insulin levels are high, we can't go into REM sleep. And also, when our insulin levels are high, we can't go raise our growth hormone levels. They're mutually exclusive. You have high blood sugar and high insulin, you can't raise your, blood, your, your growth hormone levels. And when you can't do that, growth hormone is your repair and regeneration hormone there. So you literally prevent that last snack, that ice cream just before you go to bed, prevents you from actually healing and repairing and regenerating that entire night. You literally blow it your whole entire night. And what if you do that while you're watching TV in bed? Does that make sense? And then you lay in bed and you can't figure out why you can't go to sleep because you're, you're stressing about everything there. But the, when we start looking at sleep problems, they're also, we start looking at, these are all neurologic disorders, like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, they finally came out, but they finally figured out that Alzheimer's is not something that you catch. Does that make sense? You don't catch Parkinson's. You don't catch behavioral problems in children. It's not something that you like, oh, 
Sorry, you got ADD. Does that make sense? Like, the, you look at the ADD medication, it prevents a child from going into REM sleep, and because the children can't go to sleep, they give them sleeping medication, which prevents them from going into REM sleep again. And so all of a sudden, we perpetuate this insanity, crazy world cycle over here. So what we have to look at is because these are neuro neurologic stresses, when the, the nervous system is under stress, all, your whole body is under stress. Your body cannot differentiate between emotional, physical, and chemical stress. It thinks it's all real. It puts it into one melting pot there. So when we take these medications, what we have to look at is high blood pressure medications. They interfere with your body going into REM sleep. So guess what one of the side effects of your body not going into REM sleep? High blood pressure. So then we take our high blood pressure medications and we're like, I'm trying to do everything right. Why can't I get off my medications? My blood pressure won't go down. Uh, we look at uh, analgesics. We know that like a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, like an Advil, it's gonna, we know that it causes cartilage degeneration in your joints every single time you take it. It's an anti-inflammatory, your knee hurts, take it. Well, we know it accelerates cartilage degeneration, but we also know that it actually prevents your body from going into REM sleep, which prevents your body from healing and repairing and regenerating. So why doesn't it, what, what's the long-term effect of that? And we start looking at these antihistamines, over-the-counter sleeping medications. Uh, we start looking at our, uh, our antacids. You know, we know that when we're under stress, it decreases blood flow to the intestines. And then guess what happens is, is now we, 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 we take our antacid, we, now we, those antacids prevent us from actually getting sleep. And then we wake up in the morning, we have decreased blood flow to the intestines, and now we can't digest our food, so we take our antacid. You see that crazy cycle? And you can pretty much do that for almost any medication that's out there. So the solution is, is that not trying to replicate the same thing. We have to make a decision, do we want to stay in this cycle? Do we want to stay in the same place as everybody else is? Here's a great one, depression. So watch this. Here's how depression works. You come into your doctor's office and they'll give you a depression questionnaire, if they even give you the depression questionnaire. And one of the big key questions is, is do you have difficulty falling asleep, periodic wakings, early morning waking? Uh, these might be symptomatic of depression. So. The doctor says, you qualify as being depressed, so we're gonna give you this antidepressant which suppresses your REM sleep, but then what happens is, that when we suppress REM sleep, we become depressed. And then you go into your doctor and you're like, I'm still depressed. And he's like, well, well you might have to take more. <laughs> and then eventually we get to this place where now that medication doesn't work and now we're not really sleeping, so we take our sleep medication which then perpetuates it. And it, that's that vicious, crazy cycle that I want you guys to see and understand that sleep is not just something that is necessary, uh, necessary for you to do, it's an absolute necessity for you to be able to do. If you're ever to get healthy, you have to be able to sleep there. Children, 38% of pediatricians are now surveyed uh, actually say that they recommend sleeping medications for kids. Oh my gosh, are you serious? Like they've never even been tested on children. And think of what that does to a developing brain to not be able to get into REM sleep. And then we, we, we start looking at what happens to these children. Their bodies are under emotional, physical, and chemical stresses. Think of the lives that they live, and they're in cars, and they're, you know, when we were kids, we used to have to ride our bikes and get exercise. We'd come home so exhausted, and we'd fall asleep at the dinner table there, right? And we'd actually be eating food, um, instead of like, you know, something that was just brought in by DoorDash. <laughs> now it turns out that when we're not sleeping, and the problem is this, is that we think that we can catch up, right? I just had a bad night's sleep. Well, if you don't, if you miss a, your, a good night's sleep, it takes about two weeks for your body to catch up. So let's say you, this is uh, New Year's Eve, and you decide you're gonna go tie one on, and you're gonna drink alcohol. And if you ever, like, not saying that you have or you have not, but let's say somebody was, had a whole bunch of alcohol, and you're like, I'm just gonna go to bed early. And you wake up at three in the morning, you're like, why the heck am I up at three in the morning, first of all? Like, I should be sleeping until, you know, 12 the next day. Well, first of all, your liver wakes you up at three o'clock because it's start trying to process that information, that process that. Second of all, the alcohol prevents you from going into REM sleep. So if you have that little nightcap every single night before you go to bed, you're preventing your body from going into REM sleep. You're not gonna be able to focus the next day there. Problem is, is one single night of interfering with your REM sleep takes up to two weeks for the neurons to, to regenerate themselves. So what if you have a drink every night before you go to bed? You're just postponing those two weeks, and when we don't get enough time without those neurons degenerating, with, with regenerating, and they're re degenerating. So think about your brain health. If the, the, the neurons in your brain aren't regenerating, they're what? Degenerating. And so we have all these degenerative brain disorders now. We have dementia, we have Alzheimer's, all these different issues. 
And in fact, it's only at night when your brain actually cleans itself. So if you're not sleeping, your brain's not gonna be able to clean itself of the toxins. And they just found out that's one of the main causes of Alzheimer's disease. And if you've ever known somebody with Alzheimer's disease, it's a devastating disorder. But God didn't forget about you the moment that, he, that you were born. He created a way for you to actually be able to cleanse your brain. You weren't designed, you're not, you don't catch Alzheimer's disease, you do things to acquire Alzheimer's disease. And it's impossible at times to be able to treat it. You have to get ahead of it there. So here's Beverly. Beverly comes in, she's 88 years old, okay? And so do you remember what a normal healthy spine looks like? So is that a normal healthy spine right there? Right? And, and, and if you, and she, the one question that she came in with, she's like, and I was telling her, okay, so you have a power in your body, your body knows how to heal, and she looks at me, and she, she's missing a leg from the car accident back in 1979. She's got arthritis and degeneration all over the place. She has scars on her face from the car accident. She goes, do you know how old I am? I'm like, no, does it, it, are you alive? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, it doesn't matter. Your body knows how to heal. But what we have to do is we have to get rid of the interference there. So when we start looking at her, what's the first thing that we have to do? Do I talk to her about going into sleep? Because do you think her nervous system's under stress? Do you think like she has all these stress hormones in her body? Do you think her body's getting a good night's sleep there? Do I, do I talk to her about nutrition first? What do you think the first thing I gotta do for her is? I gotta get the stress off her nervous system. Does that make sense? Like, like this is our starting point. I can teach you nutrition, but if, you're not, if your body isn't able to perceive the nutrition in the right way, if your body isn't able to adapt to it, remember we talked about health is your body's ability to adapt to stress. And then when your body can't adapt to stress, that's when we have disease. That's all, your nervous system is how your body adapts there. The important thing is also we look at people with hormonal issues. Well, sleep's going to destroy our hormone levels there. And so like, we start looking at all these little things that start coming in. So here's Mike. So Mike is 60 years old, and I love Mike. Mike comes into my office, and one of the things that we do when you start in our office, we check your family. I mean, literally, like, if your nervous system controls your health, wouldn't you want to have, like, do you know what the angle of your kid's necks look like? Does that make sense? Do your kids have good curves or they have bad curves? If you don't know, you're just guessing at that point. And so either your nervous system controls your body or it doesn't control your body. If it does control your body and it does control how your body expresses health or not, it's probably a pretty good idea to know what it looks like. So she literally like brought her husband in. And this guy comes in with a bag of medications. He's got his antidepressants. He's got his high blood pressure medications. He's got his, uh, his diabetes medication. He's got his, like, his heartburn medication. Like all the ones that were on the list there. And she's like, and he can't sleep. And I said, well, we gotta get you off your medications. And he goes, no. And I'm like, what do you mean no? And he goes, no, I don't wanna die. Well, if you're not sleeping, you got 460% increased chance of dying. So we gotta get to the we gotta get to that cause. So what if we took him off his medications right now and did nothing with his spine and his nervous system? What do you think would probably happen? Because remember we talked about that earlier? That your body is perfect. It's an adaptation to what's happening. So like all the stresses in his body, everything, a high blood pressure, all these problems that he was having were normal based on how his body was adapting to stress. So what if we try to get him off his medications here? Well, what I will tell you is this. This is his body right here. He's off all of his medications there. We had to get his nervous system functioning right so he could adapt to the stresses of the world. And then we gave him tools. Does that make sense? We gave him the tools on how to eat right, how to exercise, and how to do all these things. This is a man that we never get somebody off their medication because people only take medications for one reason. That's because they're sick. Sick people take medications, period. Healthy people don't take medications. We have to get you healthy first before we can get you off our medications. And that's why when you walk in our office, we have a big drug jug. And it's, I have like, I have to get another, another glass container because I have bags and bags of them in the back of the office of medications that we've, correct, that we've collected from people after they get off their medications there. So here, here's this digestive disorders. When they look at people that get adjusted, 71% increase, I mean, a decrease in, in digestive disorders. Do you think it's important if you have a digestive order to check your nervous system? Yes or no? Yeah. Right. 71%. Like, like you have, without medication, that's 71% decrease in digestive problems without medication. That's a pretty good thing. Does that make sense? When we start looking at uh, ulcers, when they start looking at people with ulcers, they found that they, they healed in an average of 10 days quicker. It didn't 
fix their ulcer because their ulcer had been there for a long time. But what it did is it increased the rate of regeneration, the ability of the body to heal and repair and regenerate itself. It sped up the process so that we could get them off their, their ulcer medication. When we looked at this high blood pressure, what's really cool about this is this, is that when they, when they study people that are getting adjusted, they found that when they take the pressure off their nervous system, when they remove the interference so their body can properly adapt, it works better than two blood pressure medications combined. And so think about that person. Now we know that when that person is not under stress, they're able to sleep better. And when they're, when they're able to sleep better, their blood pressure goes down more. And then they, their, as their blood pressure goes down, their need for blood pressure medications. How much blood pressure medication can you give? It like, like, it's like putting a, your foot on the accelerator and just like gunning it, like, and, and then trying to put your brake on at the same time. It doesn't make any sense. You're just gonna blow up the engine, and that's what these medications do there. Immune function, one of the beautiful things when they get it, they, people get adjusted, studies show that their immune system gets two to 400 times greater. Not that, I, that when we adjust somebody, what it does is it allows your body to do what, you guys are superhuman. It allows your body to do what it's designed to do there. So here, what's the plan? So where the plan is, is the first thing is, look, if you got a nervous system, you gotta take care of it. Does that make sense? And like, it doesn't make any sense for me to give you strategies if your nervous system, from the moment you wake up to the moment that you go to sleep at night, is under chronic, prolonged stress there. So the thing that you have to understand, this is not about you. I put up there that insomnia affects the whole family. It affects everybody that you know. Everybody that you run into, every social interaction, everything that happens is a fact. You're gonna be irritable, it's not you, it's that, that your brain is in sleep torture. Does that make sense? Like, of course you're going to be irritable if you're not sleeping. And it's caused by emotional, physical, and chemical stresses. And the typical insomniac, like I said, is in bed for 14 hours a day. So the first thing, if we want to not be the average insomniac, we've got to do something different. And I'm going to challenge you guys at this time to try doing something different. If you want to re -sleep, reset your sleep patterns, this is the biggest key that I want you to understand. First of all, you gotta fix the stresses. You have to fix the physical stresses, you have to fix the emotional stresses, you have to fix the chemical stresses in your life. And unless you do that, nothing changes. Your life, your health is a reflection of your lifestyle. And so if you wanna change your life and your health, you have to change your lifestyle there, starting with your nervous system. The second thing, and this sounds like crazy talk, right? Restrict the time, the, the amount of sleep to six hours a night. That sounds crazy. What do you mean? I'm exhausted, I can't sleep. We gotta reset you. We have to retrain your brain. We have to reset the hormones in your body there. The next thing is you gotta get up and go to bed at the same time every day. Weekends don't count. They're not your sleep-in days. Weekends do no more damage to your sleep than just about anything there. And use the bedroom for sleep only. So if you're married, that's different. But, but uh, the, the point is, is that it's not for watching TV. It's not your movie room there. It's not your computer room there. You have to make it a sacred place in your bedroom there. Because your body anchors to certain emotions. And if we can change those emotions, we can change those experiences. So this is kind of where I, this is a big one that I want to, you guys can bring all that out. This is a big one that I want you guys to understand is that um, sleep apnea. This is a bigger, a bigger and bigger challenge that's coming up more and more. And so let's say you were to go to um, your doctor and you're saying, I have difficulty sleeping. What's he going to say? Well, I guess we need to do a sleep what? We need to do a sleep study. And guess what they're going to find 100% of the time out of 100% of the time? You're going to stop sleeping. So if 100% of the people stop sleeping in the middle of the night, well, maybe it's something that's a little bit normal as that our body is designed to be able to do that. Well, what they find is, is that what, they're, what are they not looking at? They're looking at that, that, that somebody's not sleeping, they're not getting into their REM sleep, that's why they're concerned, but they're not looking at all these things. They're not looking at, well, you're taking nine different medications that interfere with your body's ability to go into REM sleep. They're, they're not looking at that you're eating just before you go to bed. They're not looking at you're not exercising. They're not looking at any of these other things. They're just looking at the symptom there. They're just looking at the symptom there. And so, one of the things that I need you to understand is this, is that in your neck, you have a cardiac center and you have a respiratory center. Those are the things that control your, your nervous system there. You, in the bottom of your neck, you actually have a nerve that goes to your diaphragm that helps you breathe while you're sleeping there. So think about if you're supposed to have a curve in your neck and then all day long you're sitting at a computer desk like this, right? And then you have two pillows under your neck like this at night. 
and, and you're wondering why you're not able to sleep at night, don't you guys even read, who took CPR lessons? All right, so what do you have to do to get air into your body? You gotta do this, right? So let's try this, let's, this, let's be interactive. So drop your head down, pretend you're at work, take a deep breath in. Okay, now, put a, look up, put a curve in your neck. Which one's easier? Every single time, right? It's common sense. Like you're designed to have a curve in your neck. So why wouldn't we look at that? Like if we're having a problem getting air in, why do we need to have a machine that's going to force air into us? Why don't we just put a curve in the neck and allow the nervous system that allows your body to control breathing to actually be able to function at 100% there? They look at alcohol, tobacco, sedatives. Anything that relaxes the muscles in your throat will, have, will impact that. They find that if you, just, if you have sleep apnea and you just lose 10% of your weight, you go off your machine. Wow, you mean like if like I take personal responsibility for my health, that I can actually actually function better? Yeah, that's 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 the common sense corner over here. This is the non-victim corner. This is the the, the, the non-responsibility corner here. So here's the run busters that we're going to talk about tonight, and I'm just going to summarize it. And then I, I want to make sure that these are all in here for you. I even put notes on there, so if you want to write on there, that's fantastic. But I'm just going to kind of fly through these. Obviously, subluxation—that is the term that we use when there's interference with the nervous system. From the front, your spine has to be straight. From the side, you have to have three nice smooth curves. If you don't, your nervous system is going to be under stress. By default, you're going to be under stress. How you perceive the world is going to be from a stressed place. So everything in your environment is the stresses are going to be magnified. So if you're you, you, like if you're subluxated, your body's going to think that it's in a war zone every day, trying to go to sleep in a war zone. Number two, medications. Do you guys are, are we on the same page that probably if we want to have a good night's sleep, we have to look at reducing some of the medications that interfere with our sleep because most of them cause the same problems that they're trying to prevent there. So it, it, like, that's a big thing. If you don't know those medications, you have to find those things out if they're interfering. You can Google it. Does this interfere with REM sleep? If it does, it's going to cause the same problem that you came in with. Tobacco. Tobacco is a stimulant. So like, if you're, like, it, it's going to cause a constriction of your blood vessels. It doesn't relax you. It stimulates you. And so tobacco is going to have, it's going to have a swelling impact on the throat. It's going to have a swelling impact. And by the way, you'll probably die an early death because of it. Uh, Sleep medications, if you're having problems sleeping, the last approach the, that you should take is taking sleep medications because they, all they do is perpetuate the problem. Uh, erratic sleep patterns. There's Monday syndrome, is what we call when we, how we sleep Monday through Friday. And then we have our weekend syndrome, right? Like you have to wake up and go to sleep at the same time. And in fact, in the moment we're gonna talk about, like there's a 21 day process that you go through to reset your sleep patterns. So you can do anything for 21 days, but it's a pattern. Every your sleep cycles, like if they're crazy and erratic, they're still, they're still um, actually uh, habits. You learn them. They were just unconscious habits that you created in regards to your sleep. There, an overactive mind. This is a big one for us. And you know what happens is, is we call it man down by the river. Like our minds can go quicker than reality. Does that make sense? Like we like something happens and we think that this is gonna happen and this is gonna happen and this is gonna happen and next thing you know we're gonna be broken, we're gonna be destitute, nobody's gonna like us and we're gonna be living in a van down by the river and then it, it's by the Guadalupe River and so then there's gonna be a big rainstorm finally and we're gonna get washed away out to sea and then the whale's gonna eat us and then, you know what I mean? That's how our brain works, does that make sense? Like we just go from, we have this negativity bias and so we have the biggest thing that we wanna focus on in this it's like prayer and meditation. You know, taking time to actually be conscious with ourselves. But what I encourage people to do is to journal. Uh, keep a small journal by your bed. And that time that I talked about just before you go to bed, just start writing all the things down. Like, like tonight on my journal, it's gonna say, my daughter, Ashley's in the middle of finals, and she's, she, she hasn't been sleeping well because she's staying up studying, and then she calls me, and it makes me stressed that she's doing good. Like all these things that will come out like that you're thinking about and what's amazing about the human brain is that once you put those things on uh, out it says to itself you know what i can let it go i can let it go and that's the biggest thing if we can let those things go and just journal so that's going to be part of our 21 day process is learning how to do that uh tv watching before bed just just if you can put a picture over where your tv was mounted in your bedroom okay you'll probably live a longer healthier life you'll probably actually have better relations with your, with your spouse, you probably actually talk to people more 
and uh, you'll probably spend less time in there anyways if, if there's no TV there. Uh, antacids, you gotta get, if you're taking antacids, not only do they interfere with your body's ability to absorb nutrients, but they also interfere with your body's ability to absorb uh, uh, minerals, such as magnesium, which allow your body to relax there. Um, uh, alcohol, it's gonna, it's, this, is a, this is a big rum buster there. Um, we look at lack of cardio. Like when, you're, there, when your body's not moving, your body's gonna be under stress. You're designed to, be under, you're designed to move there. Carbohydrates, two hours before bed. You cannot eat two hours before to go to bed. So you have to start having a plan. So if your plan is that you're going to actually go to bed at 10 o'clock, then your last meal should be at, 10, at 8 o'clock. Does that make sense? Because it takes two hours for your body to be able to, to actually get rid of that blood sugar there. And so then if you're going to bed at 10 o'clock after you just ate, you're not going to even go into that REM state until an extra two hours. So you might lose 20 to 30% of your REM sleep for the night because of that there. And plus you're not going to be able to sleep deep if you have carbohydrates and sugar floating through your blood. And remember, insulin is actually a stress hormone, so that when you eat just before you get to bed, you're much more likely to be under stress while you're trying to go to sleep there. So all those negative thoughts that you're having during the day, they're actually going to amplify themselves. Last thing, sedentary lifestyle. Like I said, you got to move. So I want you guys to, this is like a typical patient that comes in. So Marge can't comes in, she's 12 years old. So she's 12 years old. You get this, 12 years old, she's been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, which is an end, any autoimmune disorder is an end stage stress response. Okay, so she's 12 years old and her body's already maxed out on stress. And basically her body starts attacking to herself. She also has been diagnosed with fibromyalgia, which is this chronic pain and tenderness and all over her body. And one of the symptoms of that that they treat with is they treat it with antidepressants. Um, and they also treat it with you know, anti-inflammatories, which we both know interfere with sleep. And, and then the, 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 the drugs for her RA interfere with her body's ability to sleep. But look at, this is this 12-year-old's neck when she comes in. Do you think that her nervous system is under stress from the moment that she wakes up and the moment that she goes to bed at night? Yeah. Do you think that every single doctor that she ever met agrees that your nervous system controls the function of your entire body? Is that, like, do you think any doctor would say, hey, like your nervous system's not important? No, like that'd be insane. But every single doctor knows this. It's taught in medical schools, it's taught in chiropractic schools, it's taught in my son's fourth grade class. When he was in fourth grade, they talked that the nervous system controls the body. How many doctors do you think looked at her nervous system? Zero. Zero. This is the first time she'd ever had a picture of her neck when she, when she first came into the office. But we know that fibromyalgia is a central processing disorder. It's a nervous system disorder. If you Google cause of fibromyalgia, every single site will tell you that it's a nervous system disorder. What did nobody look at? We looked at the symptoms. So what's her treatment plan? Obviously, we have to get her, ner her nervous system free of subluxation. Now, you look at these two people. This is sick. What is this? Healthy. This is healthy, right? So we get, we get, get her proper nerve supply. We get her moving. She doesn't have to go run a marathon, but we teach her how to do small, specific exercises. We give her the right nutrition to help her body repair and regenerate itself. We, and we, have, we teach her how to pray and to journal there. We eliminate toxins, and guess what? The side effect was that we, she got off all of her medications. You now have a, a normal, healthy 14-year-old girl that starts high school, that realizes that she's powerful, that she, that she has the ability to heal, that she's not broken, that God didn't give up on her. And that's what tonight's about. Tonight's about making sure that we get this message out to you. Because if there's one of her, how many of the, how many kids are out there like her? How many adults are like that? Like she, if she hadn't gotten the help, if somebody sitting at dinner just like you guys tonight hadn't said something to her parents that you need to be here, that you need to get her here, that you need to get her checked, she would be just a statistic that's out there. And that's what tonight's about. That's why we're on a mission, because there's sick and suffering people out there. And what I want to do is I want to invite you guys to be on the mission. Look, the basket brigade that we're doing, we don't have to do that. It's just, it's because we do it because it's the right thing to do, because people need help out there. The, the reason why we're here tonight is that we don't have to be that. Like, the, the dinner is just a blessing. Does that make sense? Like, this is just an opportunity for you to, us to come together. But the, what I want to be able to do is, like, the information without action me, means nothing. And really, procrastination is going to be your th the thief of your health. And so, what I want to encourage you to do is, after you uh, tonight, like either things, either things make sense or they don't make sense. Either you're like, you know what, 
common sense tells me I need to do something different with my life right now. Or we go back over to the crazy world and do the same thing that everybody else does and we expect a different result. And we end up taking the average person at 65 is taking five or more medications um, and all those medications cause the same problems that they're trying to prevent there. And they, 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 they expose themselves to the third and fourth leading cause of death in the United States on a daily basis and they can't figure out why they're alive. My invitation to you is to come over to the common sense point. Somebody's, you guys are here not because you just wandered into the room, but because somebody cared about you. And they cared about you enough to said, hey, come, I need you to hear this information. Sometimes they ask you like four and five and 10 or 20 times. Some of them like, have been waiting for years for you to be here. But the point is that they didn't give up on you because they believed in what they thought was possible in you and what you needed to hear. And so I, first of all, I just want, when, when you get a chance, just thank them for not giving up on you. And I'm not giving up on you also. And so one of the things that I want to do is I want to invite you to start off the next year right. Like if you got sleep, let's get it handled. But if you have a nervous system, does everybody have a nervous system here? Right. Um, if you have a nervous system, then like, it, it, if you don't know what your nervous system looks like, if you don't know what the angle of your neck looks like, if you don't know if your spine is straight or crooked there, it doesn't matter like whether you think you're okay or you feel good. It's either a good thing or a bad thing. You're either adapting to stress or not. Because we can feel fine right now, but what is five years from now? What's a year from now look like? What's happening right now in your body? You're either building health or you're building disease or sickness. Your body's either building up and regenerating, or it's breaking down and it's degenerating them. And the choice is up to yours. Uh, is up to you. And so what I want to invite you to do is I want you to invite you to come in. We're going to be t like we're going to be buying baskets for the, our basket brigade. Our goal is we want to get about 40 baskets out there. To we have patients. We have, that know people that are that, that are in need. We have patients that are even in need. We have that we want to get out to at least 40 people. Next year we want to get get out to 80. But our, normally to come into our office to get your nervous system checked is $285. All I ask is that you make a donation to our basket brigade of $40, and that'll allow you to come in to get checked. If you do an exam, we'll do a, a, a we'll look at the medications that you're on. We'll we'll do a review of those medications with you. We'll get you an adjustment there. We'll get your, we'll get your, you know, we'll, we'll get your body, uh, uh, and then we'll sit down and we'll go over at your doctor's report, and review those pictures, and like come up with a plan there as to where we need to go. It's going to be up to you, but what I want you to do is make sure that you that you uh, uh, that you take action tonight. So the girls are going to come around, and they're going to they're going to find a time for you. Uh, make sure that look if it, if it's good, if if you have kids at home, and you're having to figure out whether you want to bring them or not. Leave yourself at home and bring your kids, okay? I'd rather have children start off right than have fixed broken adults. Like, I, that's, that's the basic thing. We always say, oh, well, I'm the one with the problems. But what about your kids in 20 years? Like, if it's good enough for you to get your nervous system checked, get, get, your, get your kids' nervous system checked there, too. Uh, and so, if you guys have any questions, make sure, oh, we're going to stand around. I'll, I forgot to go over something. But I put in here that, 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 that the protocol as far as uh, uh, how, to, how to make those changes. So basically what's gonna happen, I'm sorry, I, I went crazy. So for 21 days, I know Vanessa's back there, uh, crazy. So basically for the next 21 days, you're gonna pick a time at 10 to 10.30. You're gonna go to bed at 10 to 10.30. You're gonna wake up at about four to 4.30. Sounds crazy, right? And if you get tired in the middle of the day, you don't take a nap. But when, I guarantee you, when you come home after enough days of doing that, you're going you're gonna to be tired when you go to sleep. You're going to reset your nervous system. All those REM busters that are up there, you're going to follow those REM busters. You're going to stay away from foods two hours before you go to bed. You're going to sleep before you go to bed there. And I just want, those are, those are the things. All the information that you need to reset yourself is right in here. So I just want to thank you guys for coming. I know that the holiday season is a crazy time of year. Um, but our goal is to make it less crazy. And, and remember, it's it's craziness is a perceived thing, and that's why we want to make sure that we you know we get that adjustment from there in our brains first, and making sure that we perceive this time that remember what it is. It's not a time about flying and presents. It's about time of family, and it, you have to be the best you to be the best family. So I thank you, and have a blessed night. Okay. All right, now you can eat.